We hear a lot about inflammation in the body, but how do you accurately assess inflammation? In today's show, we're going to talk a little bit more about glyc A, and this is a much more sensitive and specific assessment of inflammation compared to just looking at C-reactive protein, but I like to look at these two together. So glyc A paired with C-reactive protein, and instead of diving into a bunch of scientific papers like we normally do, what I want to do is share with you a really important case study from a client of mine, just looking at his C-reactive protein along with glyc A, as well as his ferritin. And I think this is really important because this will give us a better insight into his metabolic health and where we should start to address and hone in on healthy lifestyle changes. So again, when we hear about high sensitivity C-reactive protein, you know, a lot of us think that this is the sine qua non of inflammation. If this is high, then you have inflammation. If it's low, like under 0.5, then you really are at low risk of having chronic inflammation. But the co-occurrence of having a elevated high sensitivity C-reactive protein with glyc A, which is more stable and long-term, because if you get exposed to the common cold or influenza, or you have you know, maybe a surgical procedure, for, for example, or have a laceration, your C-reactive protein will increase acutely or transiently, whereas glyc A, and this is looking at the glycation and modification of your immunoglobulins in your body globally, this is more specific and sensitive to chronic inflammation. Now, when glyc A and C-reactive protein are together elevated, that's when we really start to be concerned about an increased risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event or a MACE or a heart attack stroke, things like that. So in this case, this individual, he's in his early 40s. He just wants to optimize his overall health and well-being. He has three children. He wants to be around for his children later in life. And so we're working together on strategies and tips to achieve that aim with exercise, with nutrition, with supplements, with sleep and circadian rhythm optimization and beyond. As you might notice, his C-reactive protein here on page two of his labs uh, is elevated above what I normally like to see, which is uh, three milligrams per liter. Paired with the fact that his ferritin is 726 nanograms per ml. So that just took me right away and I thought, what is going on here? There, Either he has metabolic hyperferritinemia, which we're gonna talk about today, or he has hemochromatosis, or he also has some sort of pathogenic infection or some infection that we don't really uh, understand where the source of that could be coming from. Is it parasites? Is it Lyme potentially co-infections? What's going on? Why is the ferritin significantly elevated? For example, for reference, the range of ferritin is between 30 and 400 nanograms per ml, and his is well outside of that at 726. Now, what helped me better understand the source of where this could be possibly coming from I also like to run in uh, the clients that I work with or advise them to test their MVX test. And this is the Metabolic Vulnerability Index test. Uh, and so uh, Darren Schmidt turned me on to this one. And this also includes glyc A. And his glyc A is close to 400, which is the upper end of the reference range. And this is micromoles per liter. Okay. So here's the the combination that we don't really want. We don't want high triglycerides, a high glyc A and high C-reactor protein. Uh, and that's exactly what we see in this individual. Uh, and so that suggests to me that the inflammation is more chronic, it's more insidious, it's more long-term. And so we need to crank up the lifestyle intervention knob. Uh, we'll talk about exercise, sleep, circadian rhythm optimization, some supplements that I recommended. But of course, we want to minimize exposure to persistent organic pollutants, persistent uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, heavy metals, and beyond. So folks, before we continue on, I want to thank this video show sponsor, the folks over at nadsunder.com, the makers of organic cotton underwear and boxer briefs for health-oriented men just like you. Look, you don't want to be going to the gym or exercising or going in the sauna and increasing your exposure to microplastics, dyes, chemicals, and endocrine disrupting chemicals. Because as you know, the research shows these persistent organic pollutants and endocrine disrupting chemicals, guess what? They get concentrated in your testicles and also your penile tissue. This is not fear-mongering data. There's actual research showing that men who have erectile dysfunction have microplastic particles in their penis. Now, it's not just the penis. It's all throughout the brain and the body as well. There's uh, some estimates up to like a quarter of a pound of microplastic particles are found in deceased brains of people. So this is real stuff. 
and we got to take this really seriously. It's not just about eating organic food and drinking filtered water. That stuff is really important. But think about the clothing, particularly your boxers, because you're getting really hot around the pelvic region, especially if you're exercising or going in the sauna and those chemicals that are in crappy polyester and synthetic boxers and briefs can guess what? Get into your body. And that's why I only wear the boxers and briefs made by Nats because they fit amazingly. They're super comfortable. They're durable. I've had uh, some of my pairs for now going on two years and I, I treat them really hard in the sauna. My sauna gets up to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm getting really, really hot. Now you can save by going to nadsunder.com and use the code HIH at checkout to save on these amazing certified organic cotton boxers and briefs. Now let's get back to the research and talk a little bit more about this because we know that obviously lifestyle changes are really important for helping to decrease chronic inflammation. And so I take this stuff very seriously, the lifestyle changes, because when it comes to mainstream medicine, there's not a lot of great tools to systemically decrease chronic inflammation. There's great tools to suppress stomach acid in the context of say, you know, you have uh, acid reflux or heartburn, right? Uh, you know, if you can't sleep, there's sleep medications. You know, if your lipids are high, there's tools to drive down your cholesterol, right? I'm not saying any of these are particularly health promoting but when it comes to decreasing inflammation, there's not a lot of great tools, not a lot of great drugs that can do that, that don't have a litany of side effects. Uh, people that have arthritis will often be prescribed methotrexate and uh, immunosuppressants and these things, but there are often a lot of side effects that can co-occur with these medications. So if someone has a high glycate and high C-reactive protein, we wanna start to think about the lifestyle. So what's going on? And so again, clothing and certified organic cotton underwear, you betcha, these are things that I uh, shared with my client along with making sure that we're walking particularly in the post-meal window. We know that metabolic disease doesn't happen when you're fasting. Insulin resistance doesn't occur when you're fasting. It occurs in the post-meal window. The best way to mitigate some of the deleterious effects of consuming food is to walk or exercise in the post-meal window. So we're suggesting to him a minimum of 2,500 steps after major meals. We're recommending resistance training three to four days per week, whole body exercises, making sure that we're really uh, stimulating that muscle with intensity and strength and prioritizing strength. Uh, but then because his ferritin is high, I wanted to rule out the probability or possibility that this individual had hemochromatosis or might possibly have another lesser known phenomenon known as metabolic hyperferritinemia. Now, this is actually a little bit more common than we might recognize. And so the way that we, the differential diagnosis here, there's a lot of research on this, um, Again, I, I don't see this very often, but it appears that the prevalence of this is increasing. And what's unique about this individual is he recently had an MRI on his full body and found that there was some what's known as steatohepatitis in his liver, meaning that his liver was building up. We don't know if it's fat or iron. It's likely iron, but it could be fat as well because his triglycerides were 149 milligrams per deciliter, which is about double what we'd ideally like to see, especially fasted. So what are the recommendations here? Well, we first want to rule out hemochromatosis, and this is the genetic mutation or a single nucleotide polymorphism in iron metabolic enzymes that increase the risk that one uh, would, would absorb more iron and not properly metabolize iron. So we want to rule that out, uh, number one. And then number two, we also, uh, if that gene comes back and he doesn't have a genetic propensity to have increased iron, then we are going to recommend I know it sounds primitive, but bloodletting or blood donation. So one of the best ways to decrease and increase uh, iron and ferritin and hemoglobin, hematocrit and so forth is just to donate blood. Now, I know this is a primitive technology, right? People are like, well, you know, bloodletting has been uh, used since uh, for all of human uh, history, essentially. Uh, individuals used to think back in the prehistoric days that bloodletting and using putting leeches on people's body was uh, super healthy and cured everything. Uh, I'm not insinuating that whatsoever. But it turns out there's an application for bloodletting in the context of metabolic hyperferritinemia. And that's what the research actually does show. If your ferritin is particularly elevated and it's also causing problems, such as the increased uh, fat buildup in the liver and damage within the liver, as noted here by an MRI. And what's unique is like his liver enzymes are pretty normal. The ALT, AST, and GGT were all under 28 units, international units per liter. So 
these would all be considered normal. So there was no real reason to look at the liver or steatohepatitis in the liver outside of the fact that his uh, ferritin was quite high. And if we think about ferritin, just like if you were to put some stainless steel out in your yard during the winter, it's going to rust and oxidize. Uh, and it turns out that having high ferritin and or iron can lead to pro-oxidation within the body. And that's that's not good, you know, because it can damage the eyes, the brain, uh, retina, you know, the nephrons uh, in the kidney and peripheral nerves. So uh, not a good thing. So again, what led us down this track? Getting back to looking at ways to assess inflammation, we looked at the C-reactive protein paired with the glyc A. So we have a short-term marker of acute inflammation paired with an increased risk of a long-term marker of inflammation that is glyc A. These two together, a CRP over three and a glyc A close to or over 400. And again, this is micromoles per liter, the glyc A. Uh, this is a really good thing that I strongly suggest that you add on next time you do your blood work, uh, it, uh, whether it's an annual physical or online and, and so forth, um, something that we should consider. So to be determined, I will let you know and, and tell you what we discover with this uh, individual. But I strongly, this is why blood work is great because this person is functioning optimally, former high-end athlete, you know, in, in high school and college, retired really early in his 40s, has three kids, fertile, like no overt health issues, memory issues, no cognitive decline, relatively you know, lean uh, from a, a body composition standpoint. But then we run his labs and it's like, wow, his ferritin is really high. And, you know, this is why I strongly suggest looking at iron ferritin, TIBC, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Like uh, sometimes doctors omit this unless someone is trying to get pregnant and the female is having issues. Um, so uh, really important. And we also looked at the liver enzymes and the glyc A. These are things that are often, for whatever reason, omitted. So if you want to get good labs, check out our blood to work cheat sheet. I'll put that just below the NADS link. Again, the certified organic cotton boxes and briefs that are absolutely amazing. I'm literally wearing them right now, uh, wear them all the time. Uh, below that link will also be a link to the blood work cheat sheet that I will recommend to you. So friends, thanks for tuning all the way in. I appreciate your likes, your comments, your shares. We will catch you on a future video down the road.